welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the Madden America podcast. And this week, I'm very fortunate to have been able to chat to Professor Peter Kinderman. Peter is Professor of Clinical Psychology at the University of Liverpool, Honorary Consultant Clinical Psychologist with Merseycare NHS Trust, and Clinical Advisor for Public Health England UK. He was 2016-2017 to President of the British Psychological Society and twice Chair of the BPS Division of Clinical Psychology. His research activity and clinical work concentrate on serious and enduring mental health problems, as well as on how psychological science can assist public policy in health and social care. Peter is also an author, and his previous books include A Prescription for Psychiatry, Why We Need a Whole New Approach to Mental Health and Wellbeing. And in this interview, we discuss Peter's upcoming book, A Manifesto for Mental Health, which presents a radically new and distinctive outlook that critically examines the dominant disease model of mental health care. The book highlights persuasive evidence that our mental health and well-being depend largely on the society in which we live, on the things that happen to us, and on how we learn to make sense of and respond to those events. Peter proposes a rejection of invalid diagnostic labels, practical help rather than medication, and a recognition that distress is usually an understandable human response to life's challenges. Peter, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, chat with me today for the Madden America podcast, and uh, I'm very keen to get to talking about your new book, A Manifesto for Mental Health. But before we kind of get there to start off, I wanted, I'm curious to ask a little bit about you and I know that your your career in psychology spans both the academic and the clinical. So mm-hmm. I, I just kind of wanted to ask what led you to where you are now? Brilliant. Okay, well, hi, and uh, thanks for having me on. It, it's weird. So, I, so I've got uh, experience of various um, mental health issues in, in my family and, and personally and so forth. But when I went to university, I was kind of convinced that I was going to be a physicist. And I was interested in sort of studying somewhere on the interface between philosophy and physics about you know what's true and what's real and whether we can believe in even logic if the equations of physics tell us that our human logic is out of kilter with the way that the universe seems to work and you know, what is existence and can you use the laws of physics to determine the future of humanity and, and consciousness and so forth and all of that but then I got um I, we, we didn't study psychology in the first year at university. It was a second year and onwards subject because I did a combined science degree. And then I got into, interested in psychology. And I think I started to find, again, the idea that a sort of scientific and academic and cool-headed approach to psychology started to help me understand some of the things that I was trying to get right in my head. And there's not a question of understanding it better than physics or running away to physics or running away from science. It's just I kind of hadn't realized when I was at high school that uh, I guess what we would now call clinical psychology was kind of available to me. So I I found it when I was about 19, I suppose. Clearly, having worked in a clinical setting and an academic setting, have you used those experiences to kind of influence the other parts? So was your clinical work influenced by what you did academically and was your academic work influenced by your clinical experience? Absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, part of that story is being a, a reflective practitioner and hopefully a reflective person, um, but also using kind of scientific methods to understand emotions and so forth I'm, I'm still at you know at the heart of things uh, absolutely a scientist but also uh, I'm a, a big fan of this scientist practitioner model for clinical psychology so I'm not a big fan of my profession clinical psychology being um, therapists mm. or being um, technicians I'm interested in the idea of this process that we call formulation being you listen to people you try to hear what it is that they're saying and then uh, you're not an expert in their lives, but you ca- you do think, oh, I've learned something in my academic career, or I've learned something by reading research literature that might help to explain why this phenomenon occurs. And and that scientist practitioner model, as opposed to just kind of sticking CBT or Freudian psychoanalysis, 
on every problem is, is very much my way of, uh, of approaching things, um, including other stuff. You know, why is it that human beings are so pig headed over things like racism and gun control and climate change? And, and I think psychology as a science has something to offer to those sorts of things as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's really, really helpful kind of context. And as we kind of get closer to, to looking at some of the themes in your book, one of the things, and you know, we we kind of exchange messages about this. What one of the things that I the question I ask myself occasionally is: should we should we care as individuals and society about these things? So, I just wanted to kind of pose that question to you. And so, you know, do you believe that challenging diagnosis and psychiatric treatment is just an academic exercise, or does it have relevance for the person in the street? So, this is something I worry about a lot. Yeah, you know, I, I as a as an ordinary person interacting both in you know, conferences and in scientific journals, but especially on social media, you come across people who say that our debates are self serving or uh, game playing or um, professional rivalry and so forth, and it bothers me. Um, I think partly that you know when we were talking just a second ago about the importance of a in my mind, a sort of rational and scientific approach. Yeah, I do get a little bit uh, concerned about people who say, I don't know why it works, but it works. I, I think it actually is quite good for us to understand how the world works and to shape our um, responses according to an analysis and an understanding of the situation. I, I, don't, I don't really think it's terribly safe to say, I don't know how this thing works, but we'll do it anyway because it seems to work. So, so I think there is a value in, in, in understanding. I think the other thing is um, I'm motivated not by proving myself right or, or changing your mind. I'm motivated by the fact that it's pretty clear to me that we've got a pretty poor system for dealing with emotional distress. I, I mean, I'm genuinely upset by the number of people who are on powerful and, I think, often extremely unhelpful psychiatric drugs. I really worry about the fact that kids who are struggling at school get labelled as having a disorder and then treated with mind-altering drugs. And I'm angry, not because I want to prove myself right. I don't even work with children. But I'm angry that we don't um, reform our education system as opposed to targeting individual children. So I, I worry that it's an academic exercise and I worry that we're arguing amongst ourselves while the system is collapsing for people who really need help but I genuinely believe that the one of the tools that we need to use in order to improve basic care for people who turn up at their GP tomorrow and ask for help is is to reform the way that we think about and approach these sorts of problems. If we just carry on doing what we've done in the past, then we're going to carry on labelling people as having diseases that, in my opinion, simply don't exist and giving them drugs that are going to do them more harm than good. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's clear that these issues are fundamental for both the individual and society to understand. And I think key to that is communicating these issues to people in a way that they can understand where perhaps the scientific basis of psychiatry might, I believe, have put some people off delving into this when actually understanding human experiences and behaviours and emotions is something we're required to do every day as, as individuals in society, aren't we? Yes. I suppose one of the things that frustrates me is it's not so much the idea at picking out or arguing with colleagues who take a different point of view. What really frustrates me is, is the way that the discussion is set up for us as people active in the debates about mental health, but also for individuals approaching the system mm. where the alternatives simply aren't, they're, they're not intellectually available to people. So I'm particularly frustrated by a colleague who, I'm sure, he's a, I'm sure he's a great psychiatrist, I'm sure he's a lovely bloke, but he set up in a blog this idea that if you can't recognize that somebody's ill, you are telling them that they are weak and lazy. Mm. And I'm sure he sort of believes that, and I'm sure he's a lovely bloke, and I'm sure at the same time that he sort of believes that, he sort of can't believe that, because what frustrates me is that we're left in a situation for so many people that you are either supposed, we're sold this myth that you take a kid who's struggling at school, 
And the only choice is just get on with it. It's like normal life, mate. Get on with it and stop moaning. Mm. Or he's got ADHD and he needs to take Ritalin. And I, it just so frustrates me. Why the hell can't we go, yeah, let's sit down with the teacher and work out a plan to, to help him achieve his maximum potential, both as a human being and as a scholar mm. at school. And, and it so annoys me that the choice that we've got is basically sod off or accept that you're ill. I did hear um, on social media a story, which I don't know whether it's true or not, that now there are services within the National Health Service where if you're referred for psychological therapy for so-called personality disorders, they first have sessions to assess whether you've owned your diagnosis, whether you've accepted your diagnosis before accepting you for therapy. And that's, that strikes me as nearly the ultimate frustration, which is instead of offering people help to build their lives back up in a way that makes sense for them and helps them achieve their potential, we're not only telling them there's a choice between accept the diagnosis or sod off, mm. we're making them jump through hoops to socialize them into it before they get there. So the frustration is we're not offering people real world help for real world problems. We're only offering them a choice between nothing or the biomedical model. And it just frustrates me. I understand. And, and I, I, there was a, a particular part in the book I recall where, forgive me, I can't remember whose quote it was from, but there was somebody talking about being able to discern the gap in the rainbow where it transitions from yes. one color to the next. And actually, we should be talking in continua more yes. than we talk about discrete entities. And that, that's, that really struck me. Yes. So, yeah, that's, that's a quote from uh, um, Billy Barber where, yeah, where, where the guy has to decide on whether this guy is going to hang as a, uh, as a mutineer, trying to work out whether he's insane or not yes and what's interesting about that is is i, I suppose it leads on to the the point you were saying just a minute ago about phenomena and experiences and human experiences and it hinges on the word if so if what we're doing is using labels to try to make sense of the complexity of the human condition fine but if we're using labels as indicators of disorders and illnesses then not so fine. So I guess, you know, when I look at the rainbow, if, I, if I'm talking about the colours in the rainbow to a five-year-old, then I'll, you know, I'll go Richard of York gave battle in vain. Yeah, that's fine. But I'm not saying what you need to understand is that there's a qualitative difference between this and that. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we go down those lines, I think we're, we're leading into a, a story which is, which is very misleading. So yeah, if, if we recognise that phenomena like depression and anxiety and paranoia exist but they're phenomena rather than symptoms of illnesses i think we'd be a lot better off and and peter how do you think we would go about uh we're kind of jumping forward to look at the future a bit but how would we go about starting to educate the public that these are not necessarily discrete defined illnesses that actually what we're talking about is collection of symptoms so you know how would we go about educating people that uh, you know you can have a something happened to you that is not explained by bio biology and we can still help you but it doesn't have to be rooted in an imbalanced brain or a faulty gene or, or whatever else it might be i think there are kind of two or three things that have to happen at the same time i think there is a little bit of um, offering people an alternative framework of understanding mm. so the um sort of much maligned power threat meaning framework is part of that to say mm. yeah look if, if it makes sense to you to think of yourself as having an illness or, or having a disorder, fine. But let's just put on the table the idea that there's an alternative, scientific, rational, comprehensible alternative out there. You know, it makes sense to, to, to also think of things differently. And I, and I guess that's part of what I'm trying to do in, in Manifesto is to say, you know, look, of course, when people get lonely, it affects their brain chemistry. If it didn't affect our brain chemistry, then it kind of wouldn't matter. But that's not the same as loneliness being an illness or the depression that one feels when socially isolated being an illness. We can think of these things differently. So that's one part of it. I think the second part of it is to offer people real alternatives, by which I mean, I think if you start to discuss this with people, my experience is that lots of people just say, yes, that makes perfect sense. It, so I have lots of conversations with people where after I've given a lecture or a public talk, people will come up to me and say, you know, my son or my daughter was really struggling at school. And I go, well, yes. And they'll go, 
And it was so helpful to get the label of ADHD. And I'm really worried, Peter, about the idea of saying that this doesn't exist because it really helped my son. Mm -hmm. And you start talking to people and you go, look, you know, your son is clearly having real difficulties at school. And you know, what you really wanted, I think you're telling me, is for people to take it seriously, to offer help, and that might include medication, but what you really need is this and that and the other. And on the whole, they go, yes. And when you start talking about the birth cohort effect in, in so-called ADHD, the, the fact that young kids in the class tend to struggle, the mm-hmm. fact that kids from socially deprived backgrounds tend to struggle, I think people on the whole say yes, but give us an alternative based on those, those approaches. They don't say, no, you're wrong, I want my kid to take drugs. They say that would be great if it was available. So they sort of, they're at least half of the way towards understanding that. Most people, I think, are half of the way towards understanding that we all get depressed from time to time and there are damn good reasons for that. But what the hell are we going to do? So I think the, the first part is there's a bit of explaining there's an alternative. The second part is saying we can offer you alternatives. And then the third part of it, which I'm moving towards in this book is I think we need to take some quite serious steps as a society in order to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. I was very taken with a debate very recently on on Radio 4 talking about the um, extent to which people take antidepressant medication, where a GP from the West Midlands, I think, was talking about her difficulties in medicalizing what she saw as the normal responses to social problems. Mm. And she was very overt about it. She said, you know, I, I, I don't think I've met anybody, she said, whose depression is purely biological. All of my patients, she said, seem to be depressed for very understandable reasons in their social life. But there's nothing I can do about that. Mm. And therefore, I tend to make the diagnosis and make the prescription. And so part of the reason for writing the new book, Manifesto, is to start to think, well, how would we structure the nature of services in such a way as to take some of the pressure off that GP Mm -hmm. to to force people down a biomedical route and allow this approach? And we're nearly there. So I think that we're becoming looser and more flexible in a positive way in our use of diagnoses. We're starting to think about certainly psychological therapies, but also exercise and other interventions, even things like debt counselling or employment counselling. They're starting to come in and we need to just push up those open doors, I think. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I probably should have asked this one a bit earlier on, but you mentioned a prescription for psychiatry there, which was your previous book, and that was 2013, I think. So in the intervening period, Peter, are you more or le- less distressed about where we are in terms of diagnosis and the, the kind of biomedical uh, evidence supporting diagnosis? You know, are, are you more hopeful now? It sounds like you are from what's written in Manifesto, but I just wanted to ask. I kind of am, yes. So, So I think that there's... There are some some interesting responses. So when we when we move into the sort of realm of um, guild disputes and the idea of some sort of a an intellectual battleground between a sort of more biomedical versus a, a more social uh, psychosocial perspective on mental health, yeah, there are arguments and disagreements, and I think there's stuff going on. I see on the sort of biomedical side. Um, I actually, what what I see is a lot more acceptance by the expert neuroscientists that what we're talking about is the idiosyncrasies of the functioning of our brain rather than diseases that sweep over our brain. So rather than seeing phenomena like anxiety and depression or even psychosis, auditory hallucinations and so forth, as Um, disease entities like syphilis or Alzheimer's disease, people are talking about how inflammatory processes might be the mediators between social pressures and the distress and some of the experiences that that follow. So if you take monkeys, for instance, and put them in socially difficult situations, you can observe the consequences on their biological and neurological functioning. Mm. And so what you're not seeing is people saying, uh, you know, depression is a disease created in a Petri dish and you need to take drugs for it to treat it. But you're seeing 
hardline neuroscientists saying inflammatory processes might be the mechanisms and markers and routes by which the brain responds to those sorts of uh, emotionally stressful experiences. Mm. You're exposed to, to, to social isolation, and we can see the consequences of that social isolation, perhaps in things like the psych cytokine response, the inflammatory response in the brain. Now, for me as a scientist, it's bound to have some sort of biochemical pathway because I know that my brain is a biochemical organ. So I see that on the neuroscience side. What I also see on the sort of psychiatry GP side is people started to change their language about these things. So the argument switches from, well, in terms of treatment modalities, it has already switched from saying there are basically no side effects to antidepressants to saying we've always known there are side effects to antidepressants. Now, I think that's slightly disingenuous, but I kind of welcome it. Mm. And people have also switched from saying what you need to understand is that depression is a real illness as real as breaking a leg to saying these are labels that are helpful for clinicians in making sense of people's problems. So I see some I see some some significant shifts in language, to be honest, which I think is very hopeful. Mm. So for me, you know, if people say I, I find the diagnostic language helpful because I'm a I'm a doctor, I find it very useful for communication and for research, and I think that they are very useful shorthands for clusters that appear to have some reality in the in the real world. I'll politely disagree with them, but that's profoundly different from people saying what you've got to understand is that these are real illnesses just as real as diabetes and, and that sort of language is shifting yeah absolutely and and i wonder then whether you think it will naturally follow on that the response will also shift because you know it strikes me that treating these so-called mental illnesses with drugs is a patentable thing it can generate profit it can you know be lined up in a nice scientific way and diagrams can be drawn about neurotransmitters but when you're talking about responding on a psychosocial basis then a lot of the responses are not patentable things they are perhaps connection and community and looking at people's debt situations and so i wondered will it naturally follow that a change in the language of diagnosis will lead to a change in response or will more effort need to be put in to change the balance of the response well i mean for me i mean my, my life has always been I, i've always had a little bit of a, an interest in in real politics you know the politics of of political parties and the governance of of nations mm. and i think that I mean, there's a sort of um, interesting subplot on social media about some of these discussions about the nature of uh, mental health, whereby some of the people who share my sort of perspective on the psychosocial nature of, of these kinds of problems tend to point out that, as you say, um, you, can, you can patent drugs and you can have brand name therapies and you can avoid dealing with social problems by blaming the individual and treating their so-called illness. And that avoids having to do things like education reform, mm. for instance. So people like me uh, tend to be both um, anti-diagnostic, anti-biomedical in that, in that respect, but also tend to be on the political left. Mm. But it's also the case that lots of my psychiatry colleagues are also on the political left. And from their point of view, what they say is that that sort of agenda tends to lead towards um, locating responsibility in the individual, um, saying that, yeah, you know, what, what they say is that, that for instance, in, in the UK, the health service is based on the principle that if you're ill and need help, you'll get help. But if you're not ill, then, you know, obviously carry on with your life. And the danger of of taking a non-medical approach to mental health is you're basically saying to people, well, you're on your own. Mm. So, so those debates happen. And, and I think the consequence is um, we need a little bit of both. So what we need is to understand the nature of mental health problems in the context of having a slightly more enlightened approach to uh, social issues as well. Mm. And so for me, I think the idea of applying this sort of psychosocial lens to mental health also goes hand in hand with applying a psychosocial lens to things like criminality. Mm. So I think people commit offences, 
again, for psychological reasons that are understandable. I don't think that you commit crimes because you're a criminal or because you lack Pretty Patel's level of terror in the functioning of the police. Now, I think people do what they do for the reasons that they do what they do. And I think you can analyze this as a psychosocial phenomenon. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, in order to effect some of these, I think, welcome developments in mental health care, we've got to be aware that on the one hand, you can patent drugs and treat illnesses and make money. On the other hand, there's a real danger that right-wing governments will say, well, if it's not an illness, then it doesn't need to be part of the NHS and people can pay for their own mindfulness sessions if they want, mm -hmm. jog on. And I think we need to be mindful of that as well. And we need to be politically aware of the consequences of these sorts of arguments, which is why I, I do take to heart some of the comments made by more biologically orientated psychiatrists, for instance, about the sort of work that I and colleagues do when they point out that uh, there is a risk of this being uh, incorporated by a right-wing political agenda. And, mm. and so we need to be both socially aware and uh, aware of the deb debates in mental health at the same time. I think. And so, Peter, if, if you were, let's say, given a given a grant or a sum of money to set up a psychosocially based service, you know, what, what, what kind of things would that be including just, you know, to help me kind of get in my mind, get a, a view of, you know, how this might be different to conventional going to your doctor and, you know, seeing a psychiatrist and being diagnosed and whatever else, what might a psychosocial response or service look like? Well, there's two elements to it. So, so first of all, you've got the service itself, and then you've got the context in which the, the service needs to operate. So for the service itself, um, the service, uh, yes, would include medics. It would include doctors. And I'd quite like my psychiatry colleagues to be good at being doctors. Mm. So, I mean, I guess there's a little bit of professional frustration that, you know, there, there are people in the world who's trained as counsellors and trained as therapists and there's clinical psychologists and educational psychologists and so forth who are quite good at both the development of formulations and the provision of interventions that follow from those formulations. And to be rude, I'm not sure that we need medically qualified people to take on board those roles too. So rather than seeing psychiatrists become increasingly psychosocial in their practice, I'd like them to be good doctors. I'd like them to prescribe. I don't want to prescribe. I don't think psychologists should prescribe medication at all. I think doctors should prescribe medication. And I'd like to call on them when needed. And I'd like them to use both their medical expertise and their um, responsibilities as prescribers in that context. I'd like them to be focused pretty strongly on physical health make sure people are physically well and so forth, to check out all of the medical complaints and so forth. And, you know, people with long-term serious mental health problems have very serious physical health problems as well, perhaps because of the medication, but also for other reasons. I think we absolutely need to focus on that. So my, um, you know, psychological well-being teams, if you want to put it that way, would include medical input, but I think dominated by a psychosocial perspective. I'd want um, a lot of focus on co-produced formulations and a lot of focus on the social determinants and the meaning for individuals on those social determinants as we work up formulations. I would want residential units, because we would undoubtedly need them, um, to be based on, not on the premise that people are ill and need to be in hospital, but on the premise that people are distressed and need somewhere safe uh, to stay. And that would be a very different ethos, much more like the crisis house ethos than the hospital ward ethos. I'd want a lot of emphasis on social work, social provision, uh, social interventions, debt counselling. I, I mentioned in, in my book that I, uh, I set a, an exam question for um, master's students recently where I gave the students this little vignette of somebody who in my vignette had become depressed following the failure of their business and it started to affect other parts of their personal life and I realized through the little presentations that the students were giving and it's entirely my fault rather than theirs that all of them without exception had taken a more or less a CBT approach well it's understandable that this event has happened given that this event has happened 
this guy is likely to become depressed. Now let's do CBT. And none of them, and not me either, had said, well, we need a business advisor to come in. We need to talk to the bank about a loan. We need to talk to him about his financial planning as to whether it really is very safe for him to invest more into his business or whether he needs to come up with a, an action plan to extract himself from a, a failing business. So nothing focused on the absolute real world triggers or even causes of his problems. So I'd want you know, debt advice. I'd want housing advice. I'd want close links with the police. I'd want links with education. So it's far more of a sort of a social response team rather than a brain response team. Mm. And then that leads on to another issue, which is, so you know, in the world in which we live, there are a number of ways into mental health services through schools, through other kind of community-based services and through GPs. But what, we'll re what we would really need in order to implement this sort of vision is to make sure that the provision of social services by local authorities and the provision of health services are, are much more closely aligned than they are at present. Back in 1948, when we set up the NHS, for all sorts of reasonable political decisions at the time, the National Health Service, and therefore psychiatry services, was set up with a, a hierarchy that's separate from local authority provisions. So local authorities provide a whole load of social goods at the community level, including education, but they don't provide health. Health is provided by a, a, a different national organization. And I think we need to move towards local devolution so that the system to which an average GP would refer somebody who needs help is integrated at the level of the services that exist on the ground. So instead of um, local authority workers providing some services employed by the local authority, liaising with health workers, delivering health solutions employed by a separate organization, I think we need to move to much more local devolution of um, mental health services. And for me, that would actually mean uh, moving mental health services into the local authority provision. So I, I would see a mental health team as employing doctors and nurses, but those people would be employed by the local authority as part of a, 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 of a team slightly differently to the NHS system that we have now. Yeah, and, and I guess that, that would allow sensitivity to local social or community issues, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know, whereas perhaps, you know, if, if, if I had an issue and I travelled to London for a consultation, they, they've got no idea unless they've been here whether there are particular issues with debt or violence or whatever else it might be. So it might be a more sustainably kind of person-centred approach. Well, well, I'm also, I mean, I know, see, I, I, I was, I had a department in which there were uh, public health practitioners for uh, a number of years and I, I wasn't exactly their boss, but I was the sort of academic manager of the unit in which the public health physicians worked. And at the time, they were worried about their move from NHS employment to local authority employment. So the public health services shifted from the NHS system to local authority. And they were right to be worried in one level because uh, our current government is cutting local authority budgets or has been cutting local authority budgets very severely. And while there's a political commitment to protect the NHS, there was no such political commitment to protect local authorities. So, you know, it was a difficult time for our public health colleagues. But what I see for in public health is the community level action by medics. So, you know, these are good doctors, in my experience, doing the skills of medical practitioners as they should be delivered. And so the sort of vision that I have is, yes, of psychiatrists and nurses delivering individual patient care because you know, people need it. But also, I would also really love to have child and adolescent psychiatrists employed by the authority that is delivering education. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And, you know, part of me is so angry about this. So, you know, I've been a clinical psychologist for like 27 years now, and I have experienced the hierarchical systems of the NHS. I know what it's like to work in a system where you have a medical director, where you have the socially permitted authority of doctors. And I don't, I sort of resent it in some ways, but they're not necessarily arrogant people. It's just that society does give doctors enormous power within the health system. Just imagine if you had a child and adolescent psychiatrist 
with that degree of social power employed by the system that was actually delivering schools, it'd be great. You walk in and you go, I'm, you know, I cannot permit this. You know, I'm sorry, what? You go, there is no bullying policy. The, the bullying policy that you have in this school it, it, in no way protects the children of the school. I require you to do X, Y, and Z. Great. But what we've got at the moment is CAM services separate from education, picking up the people that have been damaged by the system. I, I would love it for my medical colleagues to be providing some individual patient care, but to be much more fully embedded with the policies and actions and delivery of local authorities. And, and is there anywhere currently, I mean, I'm guessing no, but is there anywhere currently around the world that does have this more kind of locally focused, socially integrated way of dealing with mental health challenges or, or, or is this breaking new ground everywhere? No, I think, I think that, the, um, well, we definitely don't see it in, in the United States. I think in the UK, we struggle in our English, Scottish, Welsh way. We, we sort of acknowledge that decisions were made to separate uh, healthcare and local authority care back in 1946, but we sort of kind of love the NHS, so we sort of skip on past that, and we don't think that those decisions were anything that we could return to. I, I love the Nordic countries, and in the Nordic countries, the integration between health and social care appears to me to be greater, mm. and we have, I think, from my analysis of the situation, much greater um, unity of purpose between you know, the city authorities and the health authorities for each city. So what you'll find is, you know, the the provision of health being something that is the responsibility, of course, of national government, but also uh, of the city authorities. I, I was in uh, Finland last week and I went to a rather wonderful former psychiatric hospital that's now closed down in the way that these things close down. And there's uh, all of the clinical activity of the hospital has, has, has moved elsewhere and they're left with the building which is not a great building so I was asking the person in charge uh, what had happened to it and she said oh no it's still owned by the city and the point there is that the hospital was owned by the city as the city's psychiatric hospital and it still is owned by the city as the psychiatric well, you know, the former psychiatric hospital the point being in the UK the city doesn't own the hospitals. The National Health Service or the Secretary of State for Health owns the hospitals. The city, uh, as a metropolitan authority, operates on a sort of parallel level to it. So I think the Nordic countries have, have more of that integration. I think the Nordic countries also have um, slightly more openness to a psychosocial model, I think. But I think the idea that our mental health is an illness phenomenon that should be left you know, in the hands of doctors is it, uh, a worldwide phenomenon that we need to move away from internationally, to be honest. Thank you. And so, Peter, on social media and elsewhere, I've witnessed criticism of those who do seek to challenge a diagnostic approach. So I wondered if we could talk a little about that criticism and how you'd respond. Well, well I guess that the criticism that is usually made of the sort of perspective that I'm promoting tends to be the idea that it's the denial of the reality of the problems. And in some senses, I am guilty of permitting that story to, to come out. So, you know, there's stuff that I've been involved in that have used headlines not normally made by me saying things like, you know, does mental illness exist? And that there is this thing that when you deny the reality of an illness, because the illness model itself is so embedded in our thinking, that I think people listening to that infer that I'm denying the reality of their problems. So if I say um, there is no such thing as major depressive disorder, or there is no such thing as obsessive compulsive disorder, you do find that people are saying, you know, Kinderman is an idiot. He's, he's denying my experiences. Right. You know, we get things from psychiatrists saying, you know, spend a day on my ward and you'll see the reality of it. And I think that's unfair because I think I and my colleagues know the reality of people's problems. We just don't think that the best framework for understanding that reality is the one that's offered to us. Mm. And for problems, you know, where people have obsessions and compulsions, I absolutely know that people's lives are completely ruined in some cases. 
by these sorts of problems. And I recognize both the reality of them and the severity of them, but I don't think they're symptoms of illness. In the same way that, you know, I don't think that, well, I, I use in the book, repeated talking about people's sexuality. I think our sexuality is our sexuality. It's a reflection of human nature and the way that we as human beings work. I don't think some people have an illness or a disorder that leads them to express their sexuality in ways differently to mine. I think that's just the way that life goes. But it's not denying the reality of the situation. It's, it's understanding it in a different way. So I think it is important to me to try to get across the point that I and colleagues who think like me are absolutely aware of the reality of the experiences. What we are questioning is whether the best framework to explain those experiences is the mental illness concept. Yeah, yeah, it does. And and I, I can only, you know, obviously I can only relate it to my own personal experience, but my own personal view on this as someone who was diagnosed and, and you know, drugged and treated and all that kind of stuff and then came to form a different view of it, I realized when I started to look at alternative views of this that the experience I thought I had is one that had been sold to me by a psychiatrist and I was never actually given the chance to say, how does this experience matter to you, James? How would you describe this experience? I was given an experience that was based upon information that was unreliable, but I was never told it was unreliable. So of course I internalized it. So I can see that some people would be sensitive about it, but I personally very much welcome us looking at have we got this right and are we allowing people to express themselves and make sense of the meaning in their lives in a way that matters to them, not to the person treating them. I mean, I think that, that when people get profoundly depressed and when they become profoundly depressed and find it difficult to understand why they're depressed. And, you know, I think it's a very relatable phenomenon. You get somebody who's, I'm not going to name names actually, but uh, I'm thinking of somebody in the public eye who was for a time in uh, the, the late 90s, an extremely successful person in public life who has also experienced major problems with depression on and off in their lives. You look at somebody who's objectively successful, who has the things that people like me aspire to, who is no longer, who is nevertheless depressed, and you think, yeah, that's that's really difficult to explain, and and it's challenging to explain it. And I think it's for, the, for those individuals, it's very tempting to say, yeah, this is it's weird. I I don't understand how why on earth am I depressed when I have all of this? And then being said, well, you've got a brain dysfunction, an illness, a chemical imbalance, and whatever. It's a abnormality of the serotonergic system or, or it's to do with inflammation or whatever has some superficial attraction but it doesn't strike me as particularly odd to say yeah that's a really difficult conundrum to solve let's see if we can sit down and work it out we can sit down and think why might it be the case that while objectively you have all of these goods in life and, and your partner and your children are wonderful but nevertheless you feel this profound sense of pointlessness in the world. Yeah, that's a challenge. But I think it's a psychological challenge. I don't think that the default should be, well, then there's a problem with one of your neurochemicals. Let's fix it. Yeah. I think we've got to work out why otherwise successful people can feel this sense of existential doom. So I've taught medics and I've worked with medics and I've been managed by medics and I've managed medics in, I mean, in Italy, in, in the university, and some of my close friends uh, are, are medics. The job of being a medic is, is quite an extraordinary one. I, I have medical problems, and I turn up at my GP, and I say, I kind of know what I'm talking about, and I kind of want a bit of reassurance, but it's just possible that you might save my life. And then I show them the bit of my body that I think is diseased. And they have no idea what I'm coming in with. And they have to do their job very rapidly and very confidently. Mm. In the case of mental health, you know, one of the things that we don't often talk about is that we're only pretty much guessing with a bit of research to guidance. And what I see in medical training is that they're really quite wonderful people. 
you know, somebody collapses, somebody cla- I mean, did collapse on a train next to me. Me and a couple of other people were, were looking after this person on the floor. And he, you know, put a, a note on the tannoy saying, is there a doctor on the train? And these people come forward. I think it's wonderful. Mm. But you've got to have a degree of chutzpah to, to step forward. You've also got to have a framework. And I think that's part of what the diagnostic system allows, which is, why is this person doing what they're doing? It looks completely bizarre. I really don't have a handle on it. Let me reach for ICD. Mm. It gives us a handle on what's going on. And I think our CBT formulations do a bit of the same, which is, okay, let's let's use the diagram and try to fit the person's experience onto this diagram. It's a little bit like, like police officers. You know, the response from police officers to say, is there a crime here? If not, go to citizens advice if there is a crime then we'll pursue it, it it's a it's a it's a way of getting a handle on the framework and so what the doctors do is because because they're the last line of defense even the police take seriously disturbed people to the psychiatrist mm. when people are trying actively to end their lives we take them to the psychiatrist when we don't know what the hell's going on we take people to the psychiatrist i think you've got to fall back on the training and your authority and this sort of spurious self-confidence that comes from which of the ICD diagnoses best fits and so forth. And, and that's a threat to doctors. So that, that's all of what's going on. On the other hand, I think that a lot of them are really wonderful people. The psychiatrists that I have less time for are the ones who seem to have left their humanity after they've turned over page three of DSM. Um, but I've met a lot of psychiatrists who are deeply engaged, empathic, warm, sensitive, intelligent, caring, reflective people. The problem I think that follows is they get frustrated at people like me because I've never done a 2 a.m. shift uh, as an on-call psychiatrist. Mm. And at two o'clock in the morning, and I'm thinking of specific people that I know now that, that I think are wonderful human beings, at two o'clock in the morning, if she's called out to a police station to do an assessment on somebody, you know, I've never done that. And I think, it, you know, what do you do? You, you empathize with people, you try to understand, you kind of go, yeah, that must be really, really complex and difficult. And if you say to the police officer, yeah, you know, life's a bit shit sometimes, they'll go, yeah, I need to know whether to transfer them to, to the locked unit or not. What are you going to do? And are you going to section them then? So, so I think I think on the whole, my psychiatry colleagues are wonderful human beings who have been a little bit flattened by the system in which they work. Peter, thank you, and uh, thank you for taking the time to chat today. And you know, I have to say, I devoured Manifesto as I read through it, and you know, read through it very quickly, and an awful lot of it resonated with my personal experience. And I found it very accessible, and I think that's so important. And you know, I just thank. I thank you and others for being willing to put yourselves out there to challenge the mainstream and say, could we be doing things differently? Could we be more compassionate in the way that, that we think about these things? So thank you so much. Mm, my pleasure. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. So I'd just like to thank Peter for taking the time to chat for the podcast and also to say that I highly recommend reading A Manifesto for Mental Health when it's released in October 2019. To find out more about the book, you can visit palgrave.com and search for A Manifesto for Mental Health. And as always, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.